This week on Choice Hacking. Good morning. Can I take your order? Can I get a tall chai? A large black coffee. A what? Large black coffee. Do you mean a venti? No, I mean a large. He means a venti. Yeah, the biggest one you got. Venti is large. No, venti is 20. Danny. Yeah. Large is large. In fact, tall is large, and grande is Spanish for large. Venti's the only one that doesn't mean large. It's also the only one that's Italian. Congratulations, you're stupid in three languages. As you can tell from this clip from the movie Role Models, not everyone is a fan of Starbucks. Its quirky vocabulary, corporate polish, and massive growth have made it unpopular with some. But what a lot of people might not realize is that while Starbucks is now the world's biggest coffee chain, it began life as a tiny coffee roaster founded by three former academics. As it grew into the global powerhouse it is today, Starbucks managed to retain a lot of its magic by using applied behavioral science and psychology, whether they knew it or not. I'm Jennifer Kleinhens, and you're listening to Choice Hacking, a podcast about applying behavioral science and psychology to business, marketing, experience design, and more. Join me today as we examine the science that helped make Starbucks the biggest coffee shop on the planet and how you can apply some of their strategies to your own business. But before we get started, let's give a shout out to the company who helps bring you this podcast, Audible. Now, audiobooks used to be my go-to entertainment for the daily commute, but like many of you, I am now working from home, so no more commute. But I found a new way to enjoy Audible. I'm loving listening to Audible's podcasts, audiobooks, and Audible originals while I work. So give Audible a listen. It's a great gift for yourself or someone you love. Just visit choicehacking.com forward slash Audible to get a free 30-day trial of Audible Plus. That's choicehacking.com forward slash Audible. Now, on to the show. In 1971, two former teachers named Jerry Baldwin and Zell Siegel joined forces with a writer named Gordon Bowker and opened the first Starbucks store in Seattle, Washington. They scraped together investments from friends and family and even borrowed money to open the store, which at the time only roasted whole bean coffee that it sold by the bag. It wasn't until Howard Schultz joined as the new head of marketing in 1982 that Starbucks began to evolve into what we know it as today. You see, in the spring of 1983, Starbucks sent Howard Schultz, who eventually became their CEO, to Milan, Italy for a conference. Famously, while in Milan, Schultz fell in love with some of the city's 1,500 coffee houses. The coffee culture in Italy inspired him to think about Starbucks in a new way. And the theater of baristas foaming milk pulling espresso shots, and developing relationships with their customers made Schultz think that Starbucks could be more than just a coffee roaster. Starbucks could change the way Americans thought about coffee. There's lots of reasons why Starbucks eventually became the world's largest coffee shop, but today we're going to unpack some of the behavioral science and psychology behind their success, starting with their price. We all know Starbucks is expensive, but charging five or six times the price of a McDonald's coffee is actually pretty smart. That high price signals something to customers. It's expensive, so it must be high quality. It must be better than coffee from a fast food joint or a gas station because it costs more. Think of a Birkin bag. That's a purse made by luxury brand Hermes, if you weren't aware, and their prices are astronomical. Just to give you an idea, a pre-owned or vintage Birkin bag will run you anywhere from $11,000, and that's the sale price, by the way, to $328,000 on Farfetch, a site that sells pre-owned designer fashion. What do you think when you hear that a bag costs more than a house? Do you think it's made well? Better than a $50 purse from Kohl's, or how about an $800 bag from Louis Vuitton? Even if you wouldn't pay a quarter of a million dollars for a purse, it feels like there must be a reason it's so expensive. Now, that's an extreme example, but it reveals a human truth. We equate high price with high quality and value. It's down to a principle called a rational value assessment. It says that people don't value products objectively. Instead, we figure out how much something should cost based on context clues and how they make us feel. For example, in his classic book on persuasion, 
Influence, Robert Cialdini tells a true story about a jewelry store assistant who was asked to put all of the turquoise jewelry in the store on sale for 50% off. You see, customers weren't buying turquoise jewelry, and the shop owner thought a sale might help. But the assistant misheard the instructions, and instead of marking the jewelry 50% off, they doubled the price of every piece of turquoise jewelry in the store, with an unintended consequence. Up until that point, the turquoise had been impossible to sell, but after doubling the price, it sold out in a matter of days. Why? Let's back to a rational value assessment. When people saw that the jewelry was expensive, they automatically assumed it was higher quality. And this effect really gets going when those two products, the cheap one and the more expensive one, are in direct competition. And that's what Starbucks did for coffee. They charged more for what used to be cheap and dressed it in a premium customer experience with nice tables, good music, and friendly baristas. That pricing impact has been so huge that researchers have named it the Starbucks effect. In 1990, only 3% of coffee was sold at a more expensive premium price. But by the year 2000, in the middle of the Starbucks craze, 40% of coffee was sold at a premium price. By pricing its products so high, Starbucks set the expectation that coffee could be expensive. And in comparison to a 50-cent coffee from a cafe, Starbucks might have looked expensive, but the other coffee started to look cheap. And not in a good way. Starbucks spends lots of time and money creating limited edition drinks, like the Unicorn Frappuccino, or drinks you can only get at certain times of the year, like Pumpkin Spice Latte. Starbucks seasonal items are so loved that they've become cultural landmarks, like their Christmas cups that signal the start of the holiday season. When you start to see Starbucks holiday cups, a little bit of FOMO kicks in if you haven't gotten one yet. Most people know what FOMO is. It's the fear of missing out. People hate to lose. In fact, the psychological pain of losing is twice as powerful as the pleasure of gaining the same thing. The scientific name for this is loss aversion, and Starbucks knows it's incredibly powerful. It gets customers into the store and makes them feel like they're part of something exclusive and special. Got to stop it. You're you're all hopped up on the caffeine. I feel like I'm talking a little faster, but it's very hard to tell. You're racing. Well, Well, I got things to do. I'll see you later. Bye. Sure. Caffeine is addictive. But the Starbucks experience is almost as addictive, especially their app. It removes two of the biggest pains from getting coffee, waiting to pay and waiting to get your order. With its order ahead feature, the Starbucks app lets customers skip both the payment and the coffee collection lines. Your coffee is waiting for you when you get there. There's no queues or unpredictable wait times that make you late for that 9 a.m. meeting. These experience perks that the Starbucks app enables makes the whole experience feel better because of something called the peak end rule. We talked a lot about this one in episode 103 called the peak end rule, why some moments matter more than others. But if you're not familiar, it basically says that people remember an experience based on how they felt at its most intense point and at its end, not the average of every single moment. When Starbucks removes the pain of waiting to pay and waiting for coffee, it improves the whole experience. So now it becomes even easier to convince yourself that you should kick off every day with a cheeky Starbucks because every trip feels easy and fun. One of the smartest things Starbucks has done is encouraging people to customize their drinks. You can get a half-calf, extra ice, no whip, whatever you want, and they will gladly make it for you. And psychology tells us that people love a product more when they co-create it. It's something called the IKEA effect. And of course, this effect got its name from a study where researchers observed how people bid on IKEA furniture in a fake auction. The short version goes like this. There were two groups in the study. One was given a finished piece of furniture and the other was asked to assemble a piece of furniture. When participants were asked to bid on these items, the people who had built the IKEA furniture bid more for the same items because they had fallen a little in love with their own creations. So when someone orders a customized drink, 
They become a little bonded with it, whether it's a tall, non-fat, no-foam vanilla latte or a venti frappuccino, hold the coffee, extra ice. Whether the company knows it or not, Starbucks uses psychology to help make their brand more engaging. Although the store experience isn't everyone's cup of tea, sorry about that, it's incredibly popular for a reason. They have 32,000 stores in 80 countries, and about one in three Americans visit the store every month. So it might be worth taking a look at your own customer experience and starting to consider how might you use psychology and behavioral science to be a little bit more like Starbucks. Thank you for listening to the Choice Hacking Podcast. Don't forget, you can learn more about behavioral science and psychology applied to business when you subscribe to the free Choice Hacking email list. You'll join more than 5,000 wicked smart UX, CX, and marketing folks that get my newsletter every week from companies like Uber, Google, Coke, and Disney. To sign up, visit choicehacking.com forward slash subscribe. That's choicehacking.com forward slash subscribe. Until next time. I hit record a job, you can't ignore it. I'm transforming now these cars and planes, I'm always boarding. Just out touring down in Charlotte like I play for Hornets.